Testing one, two, three, four. Peter Piper, one, two, one, two. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing Mr. Mitchell.
do not have enough money. The Committee on Education and the Workforce will come to order. The committee meets today to consider H.R. 2353. Given time constraints, I ask members to insert any written statements into the record. I will hold the record open until the end of the day in order to accommodate those members who may not have prepared written statements. I now recognize myself for an opening statement for today's committee consideration of H.R. 2353. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that today is the 63rd anniversary of the Supreme Court's Brown versus Board of Education decision. This historic decision forever changed our nation for the better. It declared that the opportunity of an education is a right which must be made available to all on equal terms. Our committee plays an important role in upholding the letter and spirit of that decision and ensuring opportunities within reach for every American. 
Today, we will consider positive reforms aimed at extending the promise of a high quality education to more men and women. <coughs> Introduced by Representatives Glenn Thompson and Raja Krishnamurti, this le bipartisan legislation will empower more individuals to find their paths to success through career and technical education. There's a common misperception that the path to success begins on the campus of our nation's baccalaureate colleges and universities. This simply isn't true. For many Americans, studying for a bachelor's degree isn't the right fit. Career and Technical Education, or CTE, has helped countless men and women gain the knowledge, skills, and real-world experience they need to succeed in the workforce. These valuable programs conceived and operated at the state and local level can pave the way to fulfilling careers in a wide range of fields, including healthcare, manufacturing, computer science, engineering, and more. However, it's been more than a decade since the federal law that supports state and local CTE programs was last updated. As we all know, our nation's economy has changed quite a bit since then. Workers and employers have endured the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression. At the same time, educational institutions <laughs> haven't caught up with advances in technology. One result is a skills gap. Many employers can't find the talent and high-tech skills they're looking for, while many workers struggle to land good-paying jobs. In fact, several members of the committee traveled to California last week to meet with leaders in the technology industry. We heard firsthand about the difficulties employers face in their search for skilled and educated workers. As our economy continues to recover, one way we can help more Americans get ahead is by strengthening career and technical education. The bill before us today is largely the same as the legislation that passed the House last year with overwhelming bipartisan support. It reflects the same principles for reform that have guided our efforts for more than a year. <coughs> First, this legislation will empower state and local leaders to tailor programs to meet the unique needs of students in their communities. By providing more flexibility and simplifying the application process for receiving taxpayer dollars, local leaders will be better equipped to respond to changing education and economic needs. Second, this bill increases transparency and accountability. By streamlining performance measures and encouraging input from parents, students, and community and business leaders, we can ensure programs are delivering results and taxpayer dollars are well spent. Third, these reforms support a limited federal role. State and local leaders know better than bureaucrats in Washington how to develop CTE programs for their communities. That's why this legislation restricts the Secretary of Education's authority and limits the federal government's ability to intervene in state and local decisions. Finally, H.R. 2353 supports innovative learning opportunities and strong community partnerships. We want CTE students to gain real-world experience that will be valuable once they enter the workforce. By encouraging local employers and education leaders to work together in this effort, we can help more Americans obtain good paying jobs and succeed in their careers. I wanna thank my colleagues, especially Representative Thompson for his leadership on this issue. As the co-chairman of the CTE caucus, our distinguished colleague has spent years championing this issue. I also want to thank Representative Krishnamurti as well as all committee members for the bipartisan work that's reflected in this bill. We don't always agree on everything, but we can all be proud of our efforts to help address the nation's skills gap, break the cycle of poverty, and expand opportunity by reforming career and technical education. Before I recognize Ranking Member Scott, there are two small housekeeping items we need to address. First, I want to extend a warm welcome to Representative Ron Estes who is proudly serving the people residing in the 4th Congressional District of Kansas. I know Ron is excited to join us on the committee and there's no doubt he'll be a strong advocate for our nation's students, workers, and employers. Welcome, Ron. And second, 
Representative Estes will be joining the Subcommittee on Higher Education and Workforce Development and the Subcommittee on Health, Employment, Labor, and Pensions. I ask unanimous consent these assignments be included in the record. Hearing no objections, the committee assignments are made. Thank you, and with that, I now yield to Ranking Member Bobby Scott for his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning. Uh, today, we're here to build upon this committee's bipartisan efforts during the last Congress by considering H.R. 2353, Comprehensive Reauthorization of the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act, or the Perkins CTE. 32 years ago, with the enactment of this law, Congress first recognized the national interest in the federal government for in the federal investment for critical skills, um, <clears throat> critical skills training and technical education to meet future economic needs. Today, this is something that continues to be true through continued investment in quality CTE that integrates academic and technical skills to promote student success. Research is clear: the United States workforce is suffering from a skills gap. According to Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce, by 2020, 65% of all jobs in the United States will require some post-secondary education or training. Yet if education, yet if current trends hold, by 2020, our nation will have more than 5 million fewer skilled workers than necessary to fill those jobs. Federal investment in high-quality career and technical education that is accessible to all students, regardless of background, will help close the skills gap. CTE programs provide students with the knowledge and skills needed to be both career and college ready. Building on past reauthorizations of the Perkins CTE in last year's bill that passed the House 405 to 5, this proposal continues to improve program quality and services for students most in need of skills training. This is not the vocational education of the past. Today, CTE fosters educational environments that engage students with an integrated curriculum of core academic content and real-world work-based relevance starting in high school. Uh, Madam Chair, I was at the Paul D. Camp Community College commencement uh, last week, and somebody asked the graduates who are still high school students to stand up, and about a quarter of the graduating class stood up. Uh, so I'm happy to say that uh, H.R. 2353 represents a bipartisan, comprehensive reauthorization that supports America's workforce. Uh, the bill increases alignment between CTE and careers. It ensures opportunity for underserved students to participate in high-quality CTE programs. And I'm especially pleased with the increased focus on serving CTE students in juvenile justice and correctional uh, institutions. It allows for increased state and local program flexibility, but holds them accountable to taxpayers uh, maintaining the vital role of the U.S. Department of Education in oversight and enforcement for, for program quality improvement and equity. The bill also improves collaboration between secondary and post-secondary education uh, institutions, industry, employers, and community partners. It promotes the implementation of innovative CTE programs and improves outcomes for students, employers, and communities. It's important that each and every student should have access to high-quality CTE programs that provide the knowledge and skills necessary to compete in the 21st century economy. CTE programs must meet labor market needs, but also must work for students. They must prepare students, especially historically disadvantaged and underserved students, for success in high-demand jobs that offer living wages, employer benefits, and opportunities for meaningful career advancement. We need to make sure that uh, to achieve the goal of high-quality CTE that's accessible to all students, Congress must renew, not only um, not retreat from, the federal focus of equity and opportunity. This is particularly um, uh, important. As you mentioned, this is the anniversary of the Brown v. Board of Education decision, which focused on educational opportunity and equality in that opportunity. The federal focus includes the longstanding role of the Department of Education, not only to support state and local innovation, but also to protect and promote the civil rights of all students in compliance with federal laws. The Strengthening CTE for the 21st Century Act is a bill that renews the federal focus on equity. The bill strengthens the federal commitment to support delivery of high-quality CTE programs by retaining the U.S. Department of Education's full authority to approve or disapprove state and local plans 
including the state's failure to set sufficiently ambitious performance goals, the bill also requires federal oversight, monitoring, and technical assistance to support program improvement and maintains the full authority of the Secretary to enforce compliance with statutory program requirements and federal civil rights laws. But just with, as with any compromise, there are areas for improvement, and one area um, of concern is the bill's removal of the Secretary's current, loss, current law sanction authority for under, underperforming grantees. While uh, this authority has never been used, its elimination runs counter to the committee's efforts throughout this legislation to align Perkins CTE with the improvement requirements of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or WIOA. Additionally, while the bill improves upon last year's legislation by disallowing dramatic state disinvestment in CTE, uh, the states must leverage the maximum amount of state investment to improve these programs. And as this process moves forward, uh, Madam Chair, I pledge to work with you and our state Senate and our Senate colleagues to improve any final version of the bill. So, Madam Chair, I want to thank you again for the bipartisan process that's allowed us to work together to reauthorize the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act. I'd like to particularly thank uh, Representative Kristen Morthy and Representative Thompson for their bipartisan leadership on this issue. Our nation's students are counting on us here in Congress to make sure they're armed with the skills and knowledge that today's employers demand, and each and every CTE program is delivering results for students, for industry, and for our nation's economy. I'm committed to working with uh, our colleagues here in Congress to uphold that promise of access to high-quality CTE opportunities for all. Today's committee proceedings represents a step in the right direction, and I look forward to continued collaboration and bipartisan reauthorization process in the months to come. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Scott. The committee will now proceed to the consideration of the bill, H.R. 2353, for amendment. Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point, and any amendment offered shall be considered as read. I will soon recognize Mr. Thompson to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Without objection, the amendment shall be considered original text and open to amendment at any point. The amendment in the nature of a substitute has already been distributed and is in each of your folders. I now recognize Mr. Thompson for five minutes to explain the substitute. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, Ranking Member, colleagues, we, we meet today to restore rungs on the ladder of opportunity. As a father, I can say there's nothing parents want more than their kids and a life that is better than their own. However, only half of all Americans today expect their children to have a brighter future than what they did. As co-chair of the Career and Technical Education Caucus, I'm happy to say the bill before us today will move, help move us in a more positive direction. The Strengthening Career and Technical Education for the 21st Century Act aims to help more Americans particularly younger Americans, obtain the knowledge and skills they need to break the cycle of poverty and achieve a lifetime of success. A big part of that goal is ensuring federal policies accurately reflect the challenges and realities facing today's students, workers, and employers. Now, it's been more than a decade since the federal investment in our nation's CTE program has been modernized, and so much of our society has changed since then. A study conducted by the Brookings Institute found that in the next decade, three million workers will be needed in the infrastructure industry alone. And this includes careers in transportation, housing, and telecommunications. By considering this legislation today and increasing access to high quality career and technical education, we come closer to ensuring that these jobs will be filled by a skilled and well-trained American workforce. Additionally, we want state and local leaders to be able to focus their time and their resources on preparing students for successful careers. H.R. 2352 helps with this goal by simplifying the application process for receiving federal funds and providing states and local leaders with the flexibility needed to design CTE programs that best meet the needs of their local communities. The bill also increases transparency and accountability. We want states and local leaders to be held directly accountable to those in their communities by empowering parents, students, and key stakeholders to set performance goals and evaluate the effectiveness of the program, we ensure CTE programs deliver results. By reining in the Secretary of Education's authority, limiting federal intervention, and preventing political favoritism, 
2352 also ensures a proper federal role. Perhaps most importantly, this bill makes improvements on alignment with in-demand jobs by supporting innovative learning opportunities and encouraging stronger engagement with employers. The bill promotes work-based learning, a technique that allows potential employers to give students hands-on experience. This is a win-win for both employers and students. Successful CTE programs depend heavily on the input and involvement of local businesses, and those are the kinds of partnerships that we want to support. The substitute amendment I am offering makes a number of changes, including delaying the implementation of this act by six months to ensure the enactment does not interfere with the school year. Other changes include clarifying that, in addition to secondary teachers, post-secondary faculty are included as stakeholders when it comes to improving local career and technical education programs. Now, this amendment also requires an analysis of the extent to which efforts supported by the bill are based on evidence-based research. In closing, I want to thank uh, Representative Krishna Morthy and our colleagues on both sides of the aisle for, this, for their support and the support of this bill and for working together to move this bill forward. I urge all my colleagues to support this important bipartisan legislation, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Does any member seek recognition on this substitute? Mr. Krishnamurti, you're recognized for five minutes. Is that right? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I ask unanimous consent to strike the last word. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm honored to partner with uh, Congressman G.T. Thompson on H.R. 2353 which is a bipartisan, common-sense piece of legislation to update the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act. Today, most jobs now require education and training beyond high school. High school diplomas are no longer sufficient for the modern job market. Post-secondary education is now essential for any young person to compete in the global economy. At the same time, throughout the country, employers are struggling to find employees with the right talents, skills, and educational backgrounds to meet their demands and move their businesses and the American economy forward. I've heard from employers across the state of Illinois that 21st century businesses need highly skilled, highly trained 21st century workers to compete in the global economy. Our young people have what it takes to be those workers, but they need the proper education and training to grow and strengthen their careers. H.R. 2353 will help states and local agencies close the skills gap, giving our students more dependable and well-paying job prospects after graduating. I would also like to thank members of both parties, Representatives Langevin, Byrne, Smucker, Clark, Nolan, and Ferguson for their work to bring this bill before us today. And of course, I thank Chairman Fox and Ranking Member Scott for their incredible leadership on this bill. Perkins was last reauthorized in 2006, two years before the 2008 major economic crisis that left millions of people unemployed and, and, and which inexorably changed our economy. Our career training programs need to be updated to reflect the realities of a 21st century economy. Every student in every career field needs some form of career exploration and on-the-job training. And as a former small businessman, I'm so proud that this bill requires that local employers be involved in helping to craft career technical education programs. I strongly urge my fellow committee members to join me in passing this bill because closing the skills gap is one of the most important things that we can do to make sure our children are able to reach and stay in the middle class. This bill is an important step in the right direction. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Mr. Wilson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I am grateful to Chairwoman Virginia Fox of North Carolina and Representative Glenn Thompson of Pennsylvania for their leadership on this crucial issue. Working together with the ranking member Bobby Scott of Virginia and Raja Krishnamurthy of Illinois, career and technical education provides an excellent opportunity to promote advanced educational opportunities aligned with the needs of the workforce and diminishing the skills gap that is developed throughout our nation. 
what is being achieved is promoting jobs for fulfilling lives. South Carolina has been especially successful in using career and technical education programs to partner with businesses and create jobs, beginning with the creation of our technical college system with former U.S. Senator Fritz Hollings and late Congressman Floyd Spence. Our example of successful partnership is between Boeing and Ready South Carolina, a division of the South Carolina Technical College System. Boeing and Ready South Carolina have cooperated at each point in the educational process, working together to develop curriculum and provide materials for a simulated work environment. The success of the partnership is clear. Over 4,500 Ready SC graduates have been hired as Boeing employees, with another 2,100 hired by area contractors with over 10,000 new jobs for Boeing across South Carolina. I appreciate the extraordinary leadership of Boeing's South Carolina General Manager, Joan Robinson Berry, and the entire South Carolina Boeing team in advancing these programs that support jobs for meaningful lives. Boeing is just one of the many success, successful partnerships of career and technical education programs in South Carolina to include Michelin, Mercedes, BAE, Bridgestone, MTU, BMW, Volvo, and more. Technical education has resulted in South Carolina being the largest manufacturer and exporter of tires in America. South Carolina is the leading exporter of cars in America, with BMW alone, their world's largest investment in South Carolina, exporting $9.4 billion of product from Charleston last year worldwide. I am grateful to support H.R. 2355, thy bipartisan strengthening career in technical education for the 21st Century Act and urge its passage, and I yield the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Scott, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The amendment in nature of a substitute that's before us will make several small positive changes to the underlying bill, including changing the enactment date to align with the annual start date of the Perkins CTE grant year. The uh, amendment also emphasizes a focus on efforts through the National Activities and Innovation Grant sections by requiring that programs funded under that uh, grant program be grounded in evidence-based research. That's an improvement cha cha championed by our colleague, Representative Espelot. And so I support the um, uh, substitute and encourage members to uh, do so, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Scott. Mr. Lewis, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk, and thank you so much. Uh, dual and we're, concurrent still, enrollment. Mr. Lewis. We're still speaking. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you, Chairwoman Fox, and thank you to my colleagues in, in front of the committee. I do want to thank Mr. Thompson as well and Mr. Kristen Murthy for their hard work on this uh, legislation. Helping young people achieve success and grow into productive members of society is a goal we all share. For far too long, students have, have been told a traditional four-year college degree is the best pathway for a good paying career. That is simply not true. As the co cost of a college degree continues to soar higher and students are taking on greater debt, employers across the country struggle to find the skilled workers to fill good, high paying jobs. According to a 2015 study, more than 80% of manufacturers report that talent shortages will impact their ability to meet customer demand. Far too often, there's a disconnect in our education system. Students are led to seek expensive degrees while they continue to lack the essential skills our businesses are asking for. Career and technical education bridges this gap between classroom and the workplace, offering students a clear pathway to a meaningful career. This legislation updates and strengthens career and technical education to align student learning with the demands of our modern economy. By supporting stronger engagement with local business leaders in the development of CTE programs, students will be better prepared to fill the specific needs of the local economy. Additionally, this bill promotes work-based learning opportunities that allow students to get relevant, hands-on experience and gain skills essential to employment. I'm particularly pleased to see this legislation increase the support for career and technical education at juvenile justice facilities. For young people that have made mistakes, are headed down the wrong path, or have disengaged in the classroom, career and technical education is a powerful tool to get them back on the right track. 
when students are given the opportunity to learn specific skill, skills and prepare for a career that interests them, their desire to learn can be reignited. For this reason, career and technical education has been incredibly effective at preventing dropouts and encouraging high school completion. 93% of students who concentrate in CTE graduate well above the national average. So therefore, I am proud to support this important legislation that will increase opportunity, make a real difference in the lives of people all across this country. Thank you, Chairwoman Fox, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Norcross, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I move to strike the last word. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Scott. Uh, since I've been involved in public service, one of the hallmarks of my focus has been education. And when we deal with education, there's three components that I always look at. Is it accessible? Is it affordable? And is it relevant? Uh, and I want to thank the members from both sides of the aisle for their, and their staffs for coming together in a bipartisan way to reauthorize this important piece of legislation. A four-year college is a great pathway for some, but it doesn't have to be that for everyone all the time. I'm a product of the IBW apprenticeship, what we refer to as the other four-year degree. It allowed me to work for decades as an electrician. Nine of the 10 fastest growing occupations in New Jersey do not require a four-year degree, but they do require either a certificate or hands-on training or apprenticeship. This important bill will go a long way to provide students with opportunities to build the skills they need for those fast-growing, high-paying jobs. I'm glad my provision was included in this bill and extends the allowable use of funding. Specifically, we will see better alignment between high school and college programs, more information about educational opportunities and options provided to students, and data-driven market information curriculum to ensure that students are trained for a high-skill, high-wage job. I'm proud to support this bill that will help put Americans back to work and to ensure students are trained for jobs of today and tomorrow. Once again, we want to thank all those who put so much time into this. This is truly what we heard during the last election cycle. It's about opportunities for job and educational opportunities, and I think this goes a long way working across the aisle to bring that to fruition. I uh, reserve the balance of my time. I'm sorry, yield back the balance of my time. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mr. Grothman, you're recognized. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored to co-sponsor this bill today. I think the bill uh, moves the federal involvement in technical education the right way. I wasn't going to speak today, but I do feel I have to speak a little bit. Um, we have a great technical college system in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, it's largely funded by a local a tax on the local property taxpayer. Uh, obviously, tuition plays a role in funding it, and the state pays a role in funding it. And I was pleased to be part of a variety of legislative initiatives when I was in the state legislature uh, in Wisconsin. And I'm glad a lot of people are recognizing that we have too many people going to a traditional four-year college. Hopefully, it'll put an end to this idea of giving four-year college to everybody, because really, we probably have too many people going there in the first place. Nevertheless, I feel like I did have to speak up, because I'm getting a little bit too much sense of enthusiasm that uh, the federal government ought to get more and more involved in, in local tech schools. And that's not true. I mean, we did a great job in Wisconsin without a lot of federal involvement. I think there's more flexibility here, which is why I, I'm proud to sponsor the bill. I think it does give politicians, including myself, an opportunity to point out to young people out there that a lot of times uh, the path to financial independence, a lot more goes through learning a skill, learning a trade than a general four-year degree. But I, I remind everybody, you know, um, they should still, we should always remember that the states and the local units of government are perfectly capable of figuring this stuff out themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grothman. Mr. Polis, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank Representatives Christian Murdy and Thompson for helping to lead this important bipartisan effort. And after working across the aisle on ESEA reauthorization, it's encouraging that our committee can continue our important bipartisan work uh, with a very important topic in career and technical education. CTE has an important impact on Colorado, like other states. It's achieved uh, results. 98% of secondary CTE students went on to post-secondary education, the workforce or the military, out of their CTE program. 
uh, reauthorizing CT helps bring it up to date and recognizes innovations made over the last 11 years since the last reauthorization back in 2006. I'm pleased that my uh, bipartisan reauthorization priorities uh, include, are included in this bill. Uh, for example, the bill makes funding available for innovative career and technical programs in the St. Vrain Valley School District and my congressional district are opening our first Pathways in Technology Early College, which we often call PTECH. Uh, and uh, this the first one in Colorado. PTECH, of course, allows students to earn a high school diploma and an associate's degree in a STEM field. In uh, six years, in partnership with a private employer in our uh, area, IBM is the marquee partner. PTECH in St. Frains is a partnership between the school district, Front Range Community College, and IBM. It's exactly the sort of innovation we should encourage. I'm glad to see um, opportunity for more PTECH schools in the bill. Along the same lines, this bill also makes investments in dual and concurrent enrollment programs easier. Uh, dual enrollment programs are one of the most successful educational programs I've seen in my state, uh, breaking down barriers for first generation college goers and uh, low income families and allowing students to access uh, associate's degrees or certifications that lead to employment. Uh, students in Colorado uh, that participate in dual and concurrent enrollment are less likely to need remedial courses in college and we also know that they're more likely to continue to completion in a post-secondary education after high school. Uh, finally, I'm pleased the bill allows funds to be used for increasing access to open educational resources to save students money. Open education resources are uh, op openly licensed, free to use, often come with more flexibility than traditional uh, textbooks. Throughout the country, open educational resources are gaining popularity in K-12 schools and across college campuses to help reduce costs. They're saving both schools and students thousands of dollars. Congress uh, recognized the cost-saving potential and flexibility of open educational resources at the K-12 level in ESSA, and I'm proud that bipartisan support for open educational resources is continuing in Perkins CTE. I'm also looking forward to introducing soon the Affordable College Textbooks Act, which will encourage open textbooks at the higher ed level, consistent with the work our committee has done in CTE and K-12. Finally, I want to highlight the important advances made in this version of Perkins reauthorization compared to last Congress's version. Under this version, the Secretary will have an important role in approving state plans and providing assistance to states that need improvement. These are important accountability mechanisms to maintain our commitment to civil rights, and I'm glad to see them included in the bill. The bipartisan authorization of Perkins represents Congress getting up to speed with the realities of today's changing workforce, new methods of learning, new tools for delivery of educational content. I'm excited to support it. I look forward to working with my colleagues towards its passage on the House floor and uh, providing oversight with regards to its implementation in the coming years. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Polis. Mr. Mitchell, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also want to uh, acknowledge this bipartisan effort and appreciate the impact it will have on continuing education uh, across the country in Michigan. I'm proud to support it to vote for the Strengthening Career and Technical Education for the 21st Century Act I've committed today. Prior to serving in Congress, I dedicated a 35 year career to workforce education, helping people develop skills necessary to get good jobs and start a career path. There's something about the pride that comes from someone who secures a job that they've been preparing for. Their whole world changes when they see what they can achieve and what the work does for their family. I ran for Congress with the hope of making that opportunity possible for more Americans. In efforts to assess the needs of our education system over the last several months, I've met with students, administrators, teachers, and employers throughout my district. Collectively, they painted a clear picture. The problem is rigid curriculum that does not consider the needs of the local economy has led to a skills gap. There's a serious problem in which employers are unable to find qualified individuals to fill up with jobs and to grow. Meanwhile, many young people are unable to find jobs they lack the necessary education and skills. Every employer I met with in the last four months has told me the same thing. They struggle to find individuals that possess core technical skills. Despite expensive recruiting efforts, they aren't able to find people to grow when they're turning down work. Our school systems recognize this problem too, but far too often their hands are tied to, need, to addressing student, arbitrary student standards and testing metrics, rather than ensuring they're meeting the needs in the community. School leaders throughout my district over the last several months have been uniform about one thing. They need flexibility to address choices for students and families to develop skills to meet the needs of employers and frankly for the 21st century. Part of the problem is on the federal level, which I believe we begin to address today. The other part is on a state level, and I intend to work with my counterparts in Michigan to improve our nation's career and technical education offerings. We must update the Perkins Career and Technical Education Act to better meet the needs of students and employers. It's clear in Michigan, 
The results are demonstrated. Nearly 108,000 Michigan high school students benefit from career and technical education coursework. Students participating in CTE are significantly more likely to earn a diploma than their peers. Today's legislation will give flexibility that the community and educational leaders have been asking for. It allows states to better accommodate local workforce needs. It simplifies the application process for schools seeking funds to, to spend their time, rather than spend their time designing programs to meet federal requirements to meet the needs of the workforce. It encourages better partnerships between employers, educators, and the community. It also has increased the amount of funding that can be set aside to assist eligible students in rural areas from 10 to 15 percent, better assisting areas like my district, Michigan's 10th Congressional District. And it also increases transparency by establishing a public review process of performance with input from educators, parents, students, and employers, something which, as you know, I'm a big fan of. School students and parents have made it abundantly clear career and technical ed can be improved by making it more relevant to students, ensuring programs are accountable, involving all stakeholders, and granting more local flexibility and control. Today's legislation achieves those goals. I'm proud to support it, and we'll continue to work with the committee to, to move this forward. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Mitchell. Ms. Bonamici, you're recognized. I move to strike the last word. Without objection. Thank you, Chairwoman Fox, and thank you to Ranking Member Scott and Representatives Thompson and Krishnamurthy for their leadership in improving career and technical education. Like last year's bill, the legislation we're considering today includes a number of positive uh, provisions for reauthorizing the Carl D. Perkins CTE program. The bill integrates employability skills into CTE programs, so students are not only learning technical skills, but are also developing interpersonal and organizational skills including teamwork and responsibility and other traits that increase their chances for success in the workforce. It strengthens rural CTE programs by supporting the effective use of new technologies. It emphasizes work-based learning, which gives students real-world skills and helps shape their career interests. The bill makes sure parents and community members are involved in the development of CTE programs, elevating the voices of local stakeholders. It authorizes a much needed increase in the federal investment in CTE. It includes the provisions Representative Stefanik and I offered in an amendment last year, successfully, uh, to encourage the integration of arts and design skills into CTE programs, which is important for educating students to think creatively and work in an innovation economy. And importantly, like last year, the bill takes steps to improve equity for students who have been historically underserved in CTE programs. In addition to the positive features from last year, this updated bill includes several new improvements. It requires the Education Secretary to approve or disapprove of a state plan within 120 days. It does away with the so-called deemed approval and makes clear that the Department of Education must affirmatively review and approve plans. At the same time, the amendment clarifies that the Education Secretary may not approve plans that propose incomplete accountability systems or unambitious performance targets. It provides a role for the Education Secretary to provide technical assistance, oversight, and monitoring of program improvement plans that states put in place, and the bill includes new language that will keep in place a meaningful maintenance of effort requirement by prohibiting drastic reductions in state-level funding. The changes in this year's legislation clearly reinforce the federal government's role in advancing equity in education programs. I commend my colleagues for working across the aisle and maintaining critical federal oversight and enforcement responsibilities, which will help ensure strong CTE programs are available to all students. This is an improved bipartisan bill that will benefit students and educators across the country, including in the 25 school districts I represent, many of which have model CTE programs. Like uh, some uh, that I've mentioned before but are worth repeating, St. Helens High School, offers an early childhood education program where students help operate a center for young children, and the school's auto mechanic program is AAA certified. Sherwood High School has a popular girls-only welding class. And in Vernonia High School in Oregon's rural timberland, they have a forestry program that combines logging, milling, timber, and construction. And students in Oregon's wine country learn viticulture at Yamhill Carlton High School. I'm pleased that our committee is approving legislation today that will strengthen and advance high-quality CTE programs across the country, programs that help close the skills gap, encourage historically underrepresented students, and create more avenues to higher education and good-paying careers. Thank you again, uh, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Bonamici. 
Dr. Ferguson, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairwoman Fox, um, and thank you for bringing H.R. 2355 before the committee today. I'd also like to thank Representative Thompson and Krishna Murthy for leading this effort. Thank you very much. This is an important bill. And as a new member of the committee, I am awfully proud to, to, sponsor, to sponsor this bill. In my district and throughout Georgia, our school systems and technical colleges and communities are creating innovative tech, career tech opportunities to help transition students into the workforce. Through dual enrollment with the technical college system, um, the Move On When Ready pro Work, Move On When Ready Work program, work-based learning and apprenticeships, and college career academies like the Think Academy in LaGrange, the Central Education Center in Noonan, and the 12 for Life in Carrollton. I have visited all of these centers and, I, and have learned about the edu education programs that are there. These provide meaningful transition for students into the workforce. They rely heavily on the Carl, Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical College Education Act as a pivotal workforce development tool enabling our education leaders to develop tailored programs that reflect local workforce needs, leveraging small dollars for large outcomes. Traveling throughout my district last week, the number one issue for business and education leaders was workforce development. I saw examples of how community stakeholders are pulling together to do their part to develop career tech education. And I am so impressed by the emerging partnerships that have naturally come about as these groups work to close the skill gaps that we have in our communities. They all know the urgent need to educate students and develop job skills to fill the demands of a 21st century economy. This is a story for so many of our communities across the country and the reason why I support the effort to move forward and reauthorize Perkins CTE Act. This bill will update the law to more accurately re reflect the needs and the work being done by states and local communities, providing flexibility, streamlined application processes, promoting partnerships, accountability, and a little more limited federal role. It is time to make these important reforms, and I proudly support the efforts to modernize the career tech education. And I urge my colleagues to vote yes on the substitute amendment and pass H.R. 2353. Ms. Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferguson. Dr. Adams, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I, I'm pleased, uh, beyond pleased, actually, to see the committee come together in a bipartisan fashion to <coughs> reauthorize the Career and Technical Education Act, uh, H.R. 2353, Strengthening Career and Technical Education for the 21st Century Act, will provide the training necessary for millions of students to help close our nation's skills gap. It sets the stage for the U.S. workforce to become the envy of the rest of the world. This legislation ensures accountability, strengthening the role of the secretary in approving state and local plans. Uh, it will guarantee that these plans are ambitious in their standards and criteria. This legislation ensures funding, guaranteeing that states continue financing their programs at a robust baseline level when such plans are revised. It can also ensure that our government prioritizes work-based ba learning in emerging industries. As innovation continues to transform our world, it's important that we focus on preparing our students for the future. In order for our workforce to compete with the rest of the world, we need to prioritize work-based learning in fields such as science, technology, and mathematics. In my district, in North Carolina, Central Piedmont Community College has taken the initiative to create STEM summer camps, encouraging a love for STEM education in students grades four through 12. These students will become our engineers, our crime scene investigators, our scientists. And with this bill, more students will have a chance to pursue these community-changing occupations. This is especially important as this bill will affect a demographic that is largely made up of low-income and minority students. These students live in parts of the country that are still experiencing extremely high levels of unemployment. So this bill is an opportunity to change that dynamic promote effective partnerships between guarantees and institutions serving primarily the poor and people of color. I look forward to seeing that happen, and I thank the, chair, the chair, chair, chairman and chairwoman and the ranking uh, member uh, for their leadership. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank, thank you very much. Mr. Allen, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairwoman, and um, you know, I'm excited to join my colleagues today to strengthen career and technical education. 
Uh, getting Americans back to work by growing jobs in the American economy is why I was elected to Congress by the great folks in my district. Large part of that is ensuring young people today are prepared and excited to join the workforce. Uh, as a uh, former small business owner, I'm really proud that today's legislation builds a better partnerships with local business leaders and provides for greater accountability for the funds provided. We have to give states and localities the flexibility they need to bring business leaders to the table. If CTE programs are not aligned with in-demand jobs available in our hometowns, then we are not doing right by hardworking taxpayers. I have been involved in CTE long before I was a member of Congress. In my small business, I travel to schools and surrounding com communities to show students that a traditional four-year uh, year degree uh, is not something everybody uh, and doesn't define success uh, and doesn't necessarily make uh, you enjoy greater financial rewards. Oftentimes, they have a lot more fun and have greater rewards going the CTE route. Once I told students uh, how much uh, welders are needed and the financial rewards uh, they enjoyed, uh, they were quite surprised. Uh, I even uh, spent some time with students to show them that I could weld and uh, I learned that skill uh, working my way through college. Uh, you know, when you have young people that find their passion, it's a life changer. Uh, you know, it brings a new dimension to uh, what, uh, it, well, the reason they're getting an education in the first place. Uh, the state of Georgia has been recognized uh, by Site Selection Magazine as the number one place to do business uh, in the country. And I believe that our career and technical education system is a major factor in that selection. I was just speaking with a group uh, in the electrical, uh, electrical contractors uh, representatives and as uh, stated about the average uh, age of our workforce is between 50 and 55, skilled workforce in this country. That's why I am proud to support the Strengthening Career and Technical Education Act, and I encourage my colleagues to do the same. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Mr. Courtney, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam S <clears throat> uh, Chairman, and I move to strike the last word. Without objection. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and congratulations. And uh, again, I salute your efforts in terms of bringing forward this uh, update of the Career and Technical Education Act so quickly in this legislative session. I also want to salute the uh, uh, sponsors, Mr. Thompson from Pennsylvania, Mr. Krishna Murthy. Again, thank you for your great work in terms of, uh, again, really accelerating um, this, this important issue. Uh, President Trump uh, actually invited to the White House on February 22nd uh, manufacturing CEOs from all across the country. The purpose of the meeting was actually to support the border adjusted tax, which he has put forward as a, somehow as a, as a, a way to bring jobs back to America. It was interesting to read the press reports because actually the uh, content of the discussion migrated away from tax policy to exactly what we're talking about here today. In fact, as one CEO said to President Trump, jobs are there, skills are not. And those basically six simple words really express the challenge that I think every member, Republican and Democrat, are hearing out there in terms of talking to employers is that there are, there's a skills gap, which uh, if, we can, if we can close that gap, we will do more for the U.S. economy probably than the Ways and Means Committee and the Finance Committee and the Senate are going to be able to accomplish. And obviously tax reform seems to be fading off into the horizon, which is why, again, it is so important for us to move forward with this measure uh, as quickly as we can to respond to the message that the, uh, uh, these uh, business leaders gave to the President on February 22nd. In my district, again, I have a shipyard which has been part of the effort to recapitalize our submarine force. We build the Virginia uh, attack submarines as well as the new uh, ballistic uh, Columbia class submarines. When I was first elected to Congress, uh, the shipyard employed roughly about 7,000 individuals. A couple weeks ago, we passed the 15,000 mark. We're going to 18,000 in terms of, uh, again, the incredible backlog and the demand signal from the Navy for this critical part of our Navy fleet. Uh, when you build a, a submarine, you're dealing with probably one of the most complex challenges uh, imaginable. You're, you're um, creating a, a vessel that operates in an environment that does not support human life. It's powered by nuclear power, and obviously it's, it's uh, got armaments that probably are, are as... Um, 
advanced as any really uh, in our military arsenal. So there is no margin for error for the welders, for the machinists, the electricians, and the carpenters. And having a skills pipeline that is really able to meet this demand, particularly when it is going to be required to hire so many young new people, um, we've got to get this right. And uh, the good news is it's a tremendous opportunity. The, um, what you can do uh, with, as a nuclear welder in terms of supporting yourself and your family is really a career, not just a job. And uh, again, the, this uh, measure is just so important in terms of making sure that we, we hit that goal. I check every morning two things. Number one, the box score from the Boston Red Sox, see how they did the night before. And the second is how many job openings are down at the shipyard. And this morning, there were 195 uh, job openings. So again, the, as, the, as the CEO said, the jobs are there, but the skills are not. And that's really the challenge that this whole entire Congress uh, really has to meet. Last year, we uh, kicked off a program through the U.S. Department of Labor, Eastern Connecticut Manufacturing Pipeline, which brought in resources from the Department of Labor and used the EWIB board, the uh, Eastern Connecticut Workforce Investment Board, to bring together EB, as well as some of the other supply chain uh, manufacturers, uh, again, folks from the um, uh, community colleges and the tech schools. And again, they are showing great results in terms of that collaboration producing, uh, again, these um, new skilled workers that are going to be able to take on the challenge that our nation has, has uh, put forward out there. What's, what I really appreciate about this bill is that we are getting the Perkins Act aligned with the Workforce Investment Act that this committee produced uh, a couple of years ago. And that is, again, one of many reasons why we need to update uh, the Perkins Act, and again, I, um, I think it's, it's for every district, for every member, regardless of party or region, uh, this is going to have just great benefits and really, I think, will probably surpass almost any other measure that, um, you know, the, this Congress is going to be capable of taking up in terms of growing jobs and giving people a future, and with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Courtney. Uh, Mr. Wahlberg, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, uh, I wanted to voice my uh, support for H.R. 2353, uh, the Strengthening Career and Technical Education for the 21st Century Act. I thank uh, my seatmate, Representative Thompson, and my uh, Jim Lockermate, uh, Representative Christian Morthy, for their leadership on uh, this legislation. I'm particularly pleased uh, that the bill contains language that reflects legislation I authored, uh, the New Hope Act which allows funds to be used by state agencies to identify, consolidate, or eliminate licenses that provide little or no consumer protection and pose an unnecessary barrier to uh, entry for workers. Uh, licensure systems are often created in the name of public safety. However, many states, uh, for instance, now record require licenses to be uh, used for interior designer, hair braider, or florist, uh, but unlike licenses for medical professionals, these types of jobs have little or zero public health risk. Additionally, licensure can serve as an obstacle for families to pursue new opportunities, particularly our men and women in uniform. A survey by Blue Star Families found that 63% excuse me, of military families have encountered licensing challenges due to geographic relocation. Government should not be putting unnecessary and costly obstacles in front of people who are looking to start a new career or build their skill sets. I'm pleased that H.R. 2353 works to address this issue, and I urge the committee's adoption of the amendment in the nature of the substitute as well as the underlying bill, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Byrne, you're recognized for five minutes. Your patience has paid off. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chairman. I want to thank the uh, two sponsors as well. Um, we need to do more of this. We need to have more bipartisanship on issues like this. And the bipartisanship on this issue is indicative of the broad perception of a big hole in America. And the whole is measured by five million positions that we can't fill right now in America because we don't have people with the skills it takes to do the jobs. Now that's a tragedy in three different ways. First, those people who don't get those jobs are not earning the money that they could earn if they had the skills. We can make their lives intrinsically better if we give them the skills that they need to take advantage of the jobs that are being produced by the amazing American economy. 
Secondly, it supercharges the American economy when we take people who are not productive and give them a skill and they become productive. It enhances the overall economy for all the rest of us. And third, many of these people are on government programs. They're on welfare and food stamps and Medicaid and governmental housing assistance, which cost the government this year $800 billion. So it's a threefer. We give people intrinsically better lives, we supercharge the economy, and we save the taxpayers' money ultimately. So no wonder this is a bipartisan thing. It is so incredibly grounded in American common sense. But we've kind of lost American common sense because we started to tell people, as you've heard over and over again, you have to have a four-year college degree to get a good life. Now I'm going to tell a little joke, but it's a trope that says the truth. There's a lawyer. He hires a plumber to come to his house. The plumber is going to do some plumbing work. And when he's done, he hands the lawyer the bill for his services. The lawyer looks at the bill and says, wow, look at your hourly rate. I can't charge that much, and I'm a lawyer. And the plumber looks at it and says, yeah, I couldn't charge that much when I was a lawyer either. <laughs> but what that tells us is, is that the economy is, is, is showing us how valuable those skills are. Yet we've had this policy in America that we're trying to shove everybody over to four-year colleges. Well, guess what? There's some really good careers out there for people that don't have a four-year college degree. I ran the two-year college system in Alabama. The fastest growing component of people in community colleges around the country are people with a baccalaureate degree who are coming back to two-year colleges to get a workforce certificate so they can get a job. That's nuts. We're pushing people where we don't need for them to go and where a lot of them don't want to go. So this is, in my belief, a down payment. This, this bill is a down payment. It's a down payment in two ways. First, a lot of the things in this bill are going to help the money go to where it really matters. Sometimes this federal money gets caught at little things as, as, it, as it goes down the pipe. It used to drive me crazy when I was a chancellor to have people come in and say, I do workforce development. And I would say, really, tell me who you train. Oh, I don't train anybody. Well, if you're not training somebody, why are you getting any of this money? And because of the changes we're making in here, I think we're going to see the money get, more of the money get to the classroom or the training uh, room where it belongs. But secondly, we're making a very important statement. And I hope it's not just a statement of what we would like and our goodwill to accomplish, but a real commitment on our part to continue to work together to find ways that we can address not just the skills gap that Mr. Courtney did such a good job of describing, but also of, of, of filling a need in individual people's lives to have an education and a skill that they can take and make their lives better and their family lives better. And if we'll, if we'll stay focused on that, then the land yap is we're going to get a supercharged economy and we're going to save the taxpayer monies on these very expensive welfare programs. So I take inspiration from this. I hope we'll do a lot more of this. I appreciate everybody that's worked so hard on it. And I'm looking forward to other occasions where we can be here for bipartisan bills that are really making a difference in the lives of the people that we came here to serve. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. I, I do appreciate all the positive comments that have been made uh, here this morning. Uh, but I think it's time for us to move on to uh, amendments. So um, I'm looking for those who seek recognition to offer an amendment. Thank you, Chairwoman Fox. Now I have an amendment at the desk, but later. I'll get this in yet. Ms. Wilson, do you seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. The, 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 uh, Mr. Thompson, you're Madam recognized. Chair. Madam Chair, I reserve a point of order on the amendment. Uh, Mr. Thompson reserves a point of order. The clerk will distribute the amendment. Ms. Wilson, you're recognized for five minutes to explain your amendment. I have an amendment at the desk, but I do intend to withdraw this amendment. I want to thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Scott. My amendment sought to ensure that ex-offenders are included as a special population under the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act. 
ex-offenders who are disproportionately young men of color face numerous hurdles as they try to reintegrate into society after serving their time. It is very challenging for them to find a decent job, which is a necessary first step to build self-esteem and develop self-sufficiently. Unfortunately, as hard as ex-offenders try to find work, a prior criminal history can be a serious hindrance. Some employees use it as an excuse to make them continue paying for their crimes long after they've served their time. In some states, one mistake can lead to the loss of basic civil rights, like the right to vote, the right to certain licenses, and the right to work in certain fields. Incarceration for some individuals not only, focuses, not only forces them to live with the stigma of being an ex-offender, but also prevents them from accessing opportunities to develop the skills, training, or work history that can help them secure good jobs. I strongly believe that they can significantly benefit from the educational and training opportunities available under the CTE Perkins Act. Young men of color, especially those with a criminal past, need all the help they can get. Federal funds for skills and training programs should be leveraged to ensure that they are afforded every opportunity to integrate fully into community life and become contributing and taxpaying members of our society. Although I'm withdrawing this amendment, I look forward to working with the chair and Congressman Thompson, the sponsor of this bill, as well as our colleagues in the Senate in a bipartisan fashion to ensure that young people with nonviolent criminal past have access to the technical and educational programs they will, that will put them on the right path and lift them out of poverty. Mr. Chair, I yield back the balance. Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wilson. Uh, since you've withdrawn the amendment, I'll withdraw the point of order. Mr. Lewis, you are recognized to offer an amendment. <laughs> I never thought we would get here. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman. My apologies for my eagerness to offer this amendment, but this underlying legislation is so gratifying, and it's great to see the bipartisan nature uh, that, that, that has been worked on over this bill, and so uh, if we can improve it in any way, that's certainly what I want to do with the amendment. Dual and concurrent enrollment strengthens the pathway between secondary and post-secondary education and has been effective at increasing academic success. By allowing high school students to begin earning post-secondary credit, dual enrollment can shorten the time to a degree or a credential completion. It puts students on the fast track to a meaningful career as we've all heard today. And it saves families a significant amount of money. According to data from the National Center for Education Statistics, one-third of dual enrollment credits were earned through a CTE course. The demand for these programs has been growing enormously in recent years as more students and families take note of the advantages dual enrollment opportunities can provide. In my home state of Minnesota alone, participation in these programs grew by nearly 50 percent between 2007 and 2015. Students who participate in dual enrollment are more likely to continue and pursue post-secondary education, less likely to need remediation in college, and more likely to complete a degree. How many times have we all seen in our own experience some young man uh, having trouble in, in high school and all of a sudden he gets his head beneath the hood of a car and a light goes off, something clicks. That's what happens with CTE and dual enrollment. My district is lucky to be home to a great technical college, or a number of technical colleges, and programs that do excellent job in creating these opportunities. For example, in Rosemont, Minnesota, Dakota County Technical College partners with local employers to provide students customized training that fits employer-specific needs. Strengthening dual enrollment opportunities allows more students to successfully transition into effective programs like these. The underlying legislation makes strong investments in dual and concurrent enrollment. My amendment will further these efforts by requiring that dual and concurrent enrollment opportunities are included in state plans, ensuring more information about these opportunities being provided to students and parents. Additionally, it will encourage states to develop articulation agreements to ensure post-secondary credits earned are transferable toward a recognized post-secondary credential. 
I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and the underlying bill, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Polis, I believe you want to be recognized for five minutes. I do, and I want to thank uh, my colleague, Mr. Lewis, uh, for bringing forward this amendment. Uh, dual and concurrent enrollment programs offer tremendous opportunity, particularly for first-generation college goers, uh, to help bridge the gap economically and academically and socially uh, between high school and college. Uh, with regard to economics, we all know that the cost of a college degree is high, and when students can complete a year or two years, even an associate's degree, uh, whether they end there or if they choose to go on to a four-year degree, that can reduce the cost by 25 to 50 percent. Ap academically, we know that students who participate in dual and concurrent enrollment have less need for remediation uh, when they go to higher ed. And just as important socially, for especially for first-generation college goers, to show that students can achieve uh, in a college level course goes a long way to breaking down the stigma uh, that keeps many students from attending college, showing that yes, I can do it. Yes, I can succeed at the college level. So certainly uh, making sure that states are more thoughtful about including dual and enrollment opportunities in their plan is a positive step, as is the underlying uh, language of the CTE bill, which also supports dual and concurrent uh, enrollment pr uh, programs. One of the biggest barriers to college continues to be cost. I feel that this is an important part of the solution. When students get to a four-year university with two years completed, that saves 50% off the cost. With one year completed, 25% off the cost. There's a number of ways to see the benefits of dual and concurrent enrollment, even in uh, rural and underserved districts. Uh, it can be done, uh, as we know, by training up existing teachers uh, within a school district to deliver college-level courses. It can be done by bringing in, visiting uh, community college professors to deliver courses. Uh, when you have proximity to community college, students can be brought to the community college to take courses there. And finally, it can be done online, and that's the only option for some schools in underserved rural communities. But regardless of which way you do it, and frankly, I look forward to seeing more metrics on the uh, relative success of the various ways of accomplishing dual and concurrent enrollment. Uh, it is a tremendous service to these students, helping them see their way towards a certification and a skill that allows them to get a job to an associate's degree, and if they choose to pursue a four-year degree, a strong head start that saves them time and saves them money. Uh, I thank Congressman Lewis for bringing this forward. I'm proud to support it, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Polis. Mr. Scott, you recognize. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> As I indicated in my opening remarks, I was at the uh, Paul D. Camp Community College uh, graduation last week, and a significant portion of the graduating class from the community college were high school students. Now, uh, they, many weren't getting their two-year associate degree, but there were certificates and things that they could get, so when they graduate from high school, they're ready to go right on the job. If they're not going to a four-year college, and they're ready. These opportunities ought to be available for those that can complete the coursework and get it done, and I want to thank um, Mr. Lewis for uh, offering the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Seeing no one else wishing to speak on the amendment, um, I'd like to ask for a vote. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. In the opinion chair, the ayes have it, and the gentleman's agreement, the gentleman's amendment is agreed to. Congresswoman Bonamici, um, do you, uh, I recognize you to uh, offer an amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, Mr. Thompson, you're recognized. <laughs> Madam Chair, I reserve a point of order on the amendment. <laughs> point of order is reserved. Uh, I ask the clerk to distribute the amendment. And uh, Ms. Bonamici, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Chair Fox. I'm introducing this amendment with Representative Polis to strike Section 122 of the bill, which outlines new provisions that undermine the enforcement of program improvement plans. Under current law and the new bill, when states do not achieve at least 90 percent on any of the performance targets they have set for the law's core indicators, such as graduation rates, they must implement meaningful improvement plans. Importantly, these plans must give special consideration to addressing achievement gaps among groups of students who are traditionally underserved in CTE programs. Both current law and the bill we're considering today require states to take prompt and effective action to make sure historically underserved students are achieving at high levels. 
But there is one major difference between current law and the bill before us. Current law gives the Department of Education the authority to withhold funds from states that fail to make sufficient improvements. The bill before us only requires states to revise their improvement plans if students continue to participate in low quality programs year after year. Although I appreciate the improvement over last year's bill to require the Secretary to provide additional technical assistance, oversight, and monitoring to states to implement the revised plans, this requirement is not enough. You just look at the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. States could revise these plans indefinitely while they continue to receive federal funding and enroll students in programs with poor performance outcomes. By striking the section the amendment representative Polis and I are offering will keep in place the current statutory requirements for program improvement plans. The authority in current law to withhold funds from states with perpetually poor performing programs that fail to make meaningful improvement is an important tool that the government can use to insist on equity in education. And eliminating this tool undermines the fundamental responsibility of the Department of Education to hold states accountable for, ser for ser serving all students. And it misaligns Perkins CTE with the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, as I mentioned, which does include the authority to sanction funds as a valuable tool for holding programs accountable for improvement. And striking this authority weakens the department's ability to uphold each student's rights to an equal education. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter from the Center for Law and Social Policy that addresses in more detail the threat to equity posed by Section 122. So Without this objection. Thank you, Madam Chair. This begs the question, why are we undoing one of the department's tools for enforcing equity? Some of my colleagues may argue that the department doesn't need this authority because it has never sanctioned a state for dragging its feet on program, program improvement. But that does, argument doesn't justify getting rid of the department's authority. If anything, it's evidence that the possibility of meaningful consequences motivates states to boost achievement among underserved students. And my Republican colleagues must know that the department's authority to withhold funds is influential. Otherwise, it's difficult to explain their insistence on removing this authority. The truth is that removing this provision will minimize the department's critical role in upholding civil rights. This persistent assault on secretarial authority is premised on a false choice that we can either have local control or a strong federal role in ensuring equity. But we can have both and we should have both. All of my colleagues should be concerned about this trend in undermining the department's authority. It risks investing taxpayer dollars in ineffective programs and more importantly, it risks the success of our students, especially those who are still least likely to get a high quality education. Madam Chair, I will eventually withdraw this amendment after discussion, but as this bill moves through the process, I hope we can reach an agreement to reinstate the department's important authority to hold states accountable for improving underperforming programs. Thank you, and I reserve the balance of my time. Uh, Mr. Polis, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank uh, Congresswoman Bonamici for her comments and for co-leading uh, this amendment with me. Uh, during our debate on the Every Student Succeeds Act, a key pillar was accountability. And how would we know that states and districts are appropriately serving all students regardless of their race, their ethnicity, their social background, their income, their needs? The final version of the SSA did provide flexibility to states, but very importantly and critically, it maintained accountability parameters to ensure that students were served well and that taxpayer dollars were used uh, equitably to serve all students. This amendment today shares that same spirit of accountability for Perkins' career in technical education by restoring the Secretary's ability to withhold funds if states are failing to effectively implement their performance uh, improvement plans. While no secretary has exercised this authority, the ability to withhold funds represents an important backstop for accountability. Not that I have a high degree of confidence that the current secretary would use it that way, but at least in theory, it would provide a backdrop for additional protections. Over the past few weeks, we've seen uh, Republican efforts to unravel accountability through the Congressional Review Act, and therefore it's more important than ever that new education legislation has robust accountability, and frankly, this provision is a small part of that. The amendment is consistent with current law under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. My amendment uh, with Representative Bonamici is not a new requirement. It simply 
reinstates one that we have in current law and maintains parity with the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act. Um, while there are other accountability and transparency provisions, which I think will go a long way, ultimately allowing the Secretary to have this tool uh, would be a positive step to ensuring equity of CTE programs from state plans. Congressman Bonamici and I uh, plan to withdraw the amendment, but I certainly look forward to continuing to raise this issue as the bill moves to the floor, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Polis. Ms. Bonamici, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and as I mentioned, will I, the gentleman, I... Will the gentleman yield? Yes, I yield to Ranking Member Scott. Uh, uh, thank you. I'd be happy to recognize the, the Ranking Member. Oh, well, it, it's, her time, it's, it's her time, and she's yielded to me, okay. and I think she's going to withdraw it. So, um, thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank um, um, Representative Bonamici for offering the amendment and drawing attention to this area of the bill that uh, could be improved. Unfortunately, uh, H.R. 2353 removes the section which outlines the Secretary's sanction authority under current law for underperforming grantees. This authority, as it's been pointed out, has never been used, but its removal does not help the committee's larger effort to align Perkins CTE with the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Additionally, uh, the sanction reinforces the role, the sanction in law reinforces the role of the federal government in ensuring that grantees are effectively using federal dollars to provide quality, equitable career and technical educational opportunities for all students. Uh, Madam Chair, it, it, it actually appears that the authority outlined in this section is an inherent authority that all secretaries have anyway, so I'm not sure why we want to uh, raise questions by removing the um, um, what is really inherent authority in the secretary. So I would support the amendment and its efforts to highlight the federal role in career and technical education, and I yield back to the gentlelady from, our, from Oregon. You're back to you. The gentlewoman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Uh, and, and again, I, I am withdrawing this amendment. I thank Mr. Polis for, and Mr. Scott f for their words. Um, th I will be supporting the underlying bill, and I, uh, it looks like all of us will. And this is a, had been, has been a great bipartisan discussion, but it cannot be without uh, uh, emphasizing the importance of this accountability for improving underperforming programs. And I hope that as this bill goes through the process, we can reach an agreement to reinstate that important authority so we know these CTE dollars are going to effective programs and helping those students most uh, in need of uh, equitable opportunities. Uh, and with that, I withdraw the amendment and yield back any balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Bonamici. The question now occurs on the amendment and the nature of a substitute. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. Um, with uh, no other members wishing to speak on the bill, I'll now entertain a motion to report the bill and recognize Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I move that the Committee on Education Workforce report the bill, H.R. 2353, to the House of Representatives with an amendment and with the recommendation that the amendment be agreed to and that the bill, as amended, do pass. The question is on favorably reporting the bill all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it and the motion is agreed to. H.R. 2353 is ordered reported to the House of Representatives. The chair notes for the record that a quorum is present. I now recognize Mr. Thompson. Madam Chair, I ask unanimous consent that staff be authorized to make necessary and technical changes to the bill and pursuant to House Rule 11, Clause 2L, I give notice that all members have the requisite number of days to file additional or minority views. Without objection, so ordered. The committee stands adjourned.